In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace of God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Welcome you all here this morning. On the basis that uh, one half of the church seems to be rather empty, I assume those who normally come are virtually running the London Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good save. I'm so glad I've got to attend worship in Nottingham. <laughs> we shall begin our worship by singing hymn 144, Come You Thankful People Come. <laughs> As we prepare to worship together, we pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our forgetfulness of the needs of the poor and repent of the ways in which we waste the resources of the world. We confess to you our lack of care for the world you have given us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our selfishness in not sharing the earth's bounty fairly. 
Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our failure to protect resources for others. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all of this, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> We stand to sing the glory. First reading comes from the prophet of joy. <coughs> Do not fear, O soul, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The, trees, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. <coughs> the children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the only way for your vindication. He has poured down for, for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. 
You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. reading from the first letter of Timothy. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. We brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation. They are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and perceived themselves with many pains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time to sing him 197. Will he not much more clothe you, 
O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. During uh, the 1970s, Sir James Lovelock and Professor Lynn Margulis developed the Gaia hypothesis. Named after the Greek goddess of the earth, it posited that in ways hitherto had been unappreciated, that the systems of the world act in such interlinked and interdependent ways that actually we must think of the earth as a living organism. Just as the human body contains innumerable systems and functions that require each other, so too does the good earth. We know that if we smoke, lungs are damaged. Without good lungs, vital oxygen supplies become affected and the system as a whole is compromised. The earth is no different. Polluted resources such as the sea or the air, and there are dire consequences for life, which depends intimately on both. Over the past decades, we've learned as a people much more about the consequences of taking chances with the Earth's systems. Most notably, how rapid population growth that brings with it increased demand, industrialization, waste and pollution, all strain the Earth's vital systems. It would appear that the Earth is heating at rates scientists believe to be both unprecedented and moreover, ones which, without remedial action, would lead to further increases in temperature, which could make the climate more and more unstable, make life more unpredictable, and challenge the sustainability of human life as it is now lived. And this is understandably causing alarm and demands for action from all over the world, especially from our young people. To this end, the United Nations 26 Climate Change Conference, what's called COP26, will take place next month in Glasgow, where these issues will be discussed and attempts made to change the course of how we are misusing this world. Of course, it's easier for richer countries to scale back, to buy a few less of the things which, frankly, we already have too many of anyway to travel perhaps a little bit more responsibly, to invest the resources needed for clean energy and renewable power. But as in so many things, the poorer nations, for the poorer nations, the choices are starker. To build richer, healthier nations, they need economic improvement. And as is the means, they will pass through periods of being key polluters as indeed all the now so-called developed worlds countries did in their past. And if we want a more sustainable world, then we have to embrace the need to help each other, to work together for a more clean and sustainable world. Our own bishop, Bishop Graham, is the lead bishop on environment for the Church of England and draws our attention to the fact that these are moral and theological issues, every bit as much as they are scientific ones. The minor prophet Joel speaks of the joy to be found from living in God's good earth. The soil and the animals, he tells us, are in very good order. There is enough for all, and life feels blessed by a God who cares and provides. As Joel says, the Lord has done great things for us, and from where he was standing, who could argue? As we give thanks once again this year for the harvest, 
and for those whose lives are devoted to the work of stewarding these gifts of food and drink, who care for the soil, the seas, and God's living creation. We can't do so without understanding the situation we are all in. We can see that we can't keep exploiting the earth without taking, without giving back, wasting the plenty that there is, allowing ourselves to become ignorant and distanced from how things grow, where our food comes from, or how nature works. During the lockdown, there's been a greatly increased appreciation for nature, its beauty, the lessons it teaches us. People have taken up growing things, connecting again with the natural world, with this wonderful world. We've slowed down a little bit. Apparently, this last two years have seen more people take up gardening than at any other time. Wonderful, really. Modern technology, we know, is in many ways amazing. But when we can't look away from the TV or up from our phones, just how much are we missing? How much goes unnoticed? Our two other lessons from St. Matthew and Timothy are bringing in some ways the same story in our readings this morning. We so often worry over the wrong things and choose the wrong priorities. God shows his love of humanity through this world and through nature, and yet we all fret about things. What are we going to wear? What are we going to eat? And of course we fret about them so much that we overconsume everything, both in food and drink, where in a world of need, one of the greatest problems is obesity with its associated diseases which is endemic even in countries that have so little, where poor quality food in quantity is preserved, preferred over healthy food in sensible proportions, where buying disposable clothes, unrepairable white goods, and where advertising and fashion lead inevitably, inexorably to waste and pollution. But do they ever lead to happiness or satisfaction or contentment? In this eagerness to have as much choice as possible and more and more to buy and consume, where is our concern for the quality of life, for the quality of this world, for those who have little or nothing? There is enough, I think, in this world for everyone to live a life of decency, a, a, a sustainable life, where no one need be hungry or cold or thirsty or unhoused or ill for reasons that can find an easy cure. We run after things as if there's nothing else to do. And yet scripture tells us again and again that we find our happiness in life, not in ourselves and our own needs, but in other people, in the service of other people. And importantly, we learn lessons by denying ourselves and taking up challenges. As the Bible says, taking up our cross. We are called to be mindful of the needs of everyone, stewards of the resources of this earth that God has given us. Waste is taking more than we need. And when we are replete, simply disposing of what ought rightly to have been available to other people. I don't let myself off because I tell myself I never buy clothes and my four wardrobes would tell you differently. <laughs> Every year I go to the charity shop and I don't buy any more and still I have more to take to the charity shop. Clearly we're very accomplished self-deceivers, at least I am, I suspect I'm not on my own. As if Matthew says we focused on the right things then we would focus on the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, quite simply, is God's vision for this world, not what we have made of it. Then how different life could be. Not just would the blessings of harvest be enough for everyone, but everyone would be able to do together the things that none of us are able to do apart. 
That's why, ironically, you need these giant gatherings of people from all over the world who partly come to tell you not to travel all over the world. But you have to have them because people must come together to find solutions to problems which are bigger, too big for us to do independently. And I return to the Gaia theory because I think it reminds us that we are in very real ways all connected to each other. If our abuse of the blessings of the earth can cause pain to others that we will never meet, then it must be true that the good we seek to do will also do good to those we may never meet. Timothy reminds us that it is the love of money which is the, the root of all kinds of evils. The fallacy that we'll find what we're looking for in things, be they the objects we wish to own or the goals we set ourselves to achieve or the security we are sure our savings or our assets will afford us, then we are to be pitied because we know that they will not. Contentment, as scripture reminds us, is in the things that aren't driven for, but are given freely by God, into which we must grow and mature. He goes on that the real life of this, context of this life, we bring nothing into it, and it is certain we can take nothing away. We are all connected by birth and death. Our journey through this good world we know is of a limited duration, and none of it is exempt from misfortune or illness. Better then that we invest in what really profits us, lives lived generously, treating others on this earth and its resources with great kindness, to do as we, to others as we would wish to be done by. Prince William has helped found a million pound prize called the Earthshot Prize, but he makes, I think, a very important point. He does not wish us to be gloomy, to think that these problems are so big that the only thing we can do is to put our head metaphorically in the sand or nip off to Primark to take our minds off things. It is possible if we act together to make the future better than the past. And I think that we must, as Christian people, believe that God wills what is good for us and that there is good work to be done here and that this is a positive thing. This challenge that's before us can be a positive thing to build a better, fairer, cleaner, more sustainable future. And I think, I hope this harvest, if we can accept these challenges, even trying to end hunger, building a cleaner, less polluted world where everyone can breathe clean air, drink clean water, eat life-enhancing foods, and take enough of what they need, but not too much, then how much further will God's good deeds go? Amen. Senator Fenner. We believe in one world. Our light, maker of heaven and earth, all that he has seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made. Of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified in the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe.
believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we Lord for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. The response to the Lord of the Harvest is, in your mercy, hear us. Lord of the Harvest, in, in your mercy, hear us. Lord God, we pray for the community in which you have set us, for one another and for ourselves. We may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. That the world may be a more sustainable place because of our recognition of our dependence upon each other and our dependence upon you. Lord of the harvest, in, in your mercy, mercy hear us. You have given your people a rich land. But humanity abuses that land. And we pray that you may lead us in better pathways. We pray for those who bear the weight of trouble and discord in our world. Remember especially those who have little of other parts of the world have much. We pray for those who are refugees seeking to establish new lives, to understand new cultures, new languages, in a land that is strange to them. Lord of the harvest, in, in your mercy, hear us. Lord of creation, we see that the fields are ripe for harvesting. We pray for your church, that it may be ready to gather fruit for eternal life. We pray for Graham Abishai, particularly in his role as leading the church's thinking on the sustainability of the environment. Lord of the harvest, in your mercy, hear us. You have created the universe by your eternal word and blessed humanity in giving us dominion over the earth. We pray for the world that we may honour and share its resources and live in reverence for the creation, in harmony with one another. So grant your blessing upon those who are gathering for the COP26 conference in Glasgow. May they come with a resolve to work for the restoring of creation. Lord of the harvest, in, in your mercy, hear us. Heavenly Father, we bring before you those who are in need this day those who are alone, those who feel abandoned or unloved, those who are in pain, those who wonder what the future holds for them. We continue to offer our prayer for friends and family and those who we bear on our own hearts and minds. We pray for David Bowen. David Kirkland, Ruth Clare, James Rock, Gwen Morris, Sarah, Amelia, Kelly Sanderson, Christine Rayner, Anna Lottie Smith, Tom Boyle, Matthew Wise, Isla West, and Stephen Milner. We pray that you may be close to them in their several needs. That you may comfort those who watch with them. 
and which you will grant skills and compassion to the medical profession who minister to. Lord of the harvest, in your mercy, hear us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, is the first fruits of the resurrection and will reap the harvest of the dead at the end of time. We pray that you will gather us all together with those who have gone before in the banquet of the age to come. We commend to you those with whom we have shared life and whose memory is precious. We commend the souls of those who have died recently, Wendy Bacon, Chris Jenny, Helen Howard, Daisy Martin, Ronald Bartholomew, and Nigel Buck. And in our years mine, we offer thanksgiving for the lives of Barry Creed, James Church, Rita Town, Marjorie Goose, Vivian Howard, Paul Moulton, Dick Joyce, Christopher Moore, Dorothy Lloyd, Rodney Dix, Fred Fake, and Paul Swain. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and, and let light perpetual shine upon us. Source of all life and giver of all that is good, hear our prayers and grant us all that is in accordance with your will. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? The harvest of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Notices for the coming week are on the printed sheet. Do please take that away with you. A reminder that next Saturday is our gift day. Uh, written about that in the magazine. And I do hope that uh, everyone across our villages will be able to give a generous response to that gift day. Uh, looking at the finances across our group of parishes at the present time, we thought as if we need to try to find an additional eight to ten thousand pounds before the year end if we are to meet all of our dues and expenses. So we commend the day in prayer to God and pray for the generosity of all in prayer and in their giving. We sing now hymn 488. <laughs>
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. You bring forth bread from the earth. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. You create the fruit of the vine. Blessed be God forever. Let us pray. The Lord is here. Taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Remember, Lord, your church in every land. Reveal her unity, guard her faith, and preserve her in peace. Especially we pray for your church in Jerusalem. Bring us at the last of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. George, St. James the Great, and all the saints, to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting grace. Blessed be the Lord and glory and might be yours forever and ever. 
Thank you. 